Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Um, the title of the sermon today, of the message today, is One Thing. Actually, I'm going to read it from the, the King James Version because I like it. One thing thou lackest. Um, let me repeat again the, uh, the scripture reading we just had because I believe it's very important. In Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5 says, And Jesus, says, uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, So Jesus, Jesus speaking, okay? Take heed that no man deceive you. Because people will be deceived at the end. For many shall come in my name, saying, What did he say? I am the Christ and shall deceive many. So hopefully you will be able to see uh, um, you know, the message that the Lord gave me day after day. And sometimes he used to wake me up in the, in the middle of the night and in the morning while I was driving and take some notes and everything and put all, all the puzzle together. And uh, it's something very interesting because today we're going to study the story of the rich young ruler. I'm sure everybody knows about the rich young ruler. I read it many times, but the Lord showed me things that i never seen before. So I want to share it with you. You remember that I'm new in the, I'm a baby in that, faith, in that belief, okay? And I think I love being a baby. I want to be a baby into for eternity, amen? So before I get really excited, let's kneel, be excited, and in front of the thrones, the Father's thrones. Father, I personally want to thank you for that we can call you Father because you are our daddy from heaven. And I thank you also for that you showed each of us here the truth about your son. This is so beautiful. This is just amazing. And that message needs to reach, that gospel, this beautiful message needs to reach out throughout the world before you're going to send your son here to take us home. Lord, I pray that uh, there is nothing about me, Lord. I pray you will humble me. I pray you will break me. You will mold me. You will heal me. That through your spirit, you will be able to speak to me. And I pray that even if it is just one person, that that message will reach out somebody to know the truth. And the truth shall set us free. We thank you and praise you and give you all the honor and glory. In the name of your son Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay. Man, I'm excited already. It's beautiful. I love it. Okay, now today we're going to study the story of the rich young ruler but not only looking at and study the st story of the rich young ruler, but also trying not to make the same mistake as the, young, the rich young ruler made. It's very important for that, okay? Why the reason, wh what is the reason behind the, the, the title I, I just chose? Actually, the Lord gave it to me. I believe the world is lacking of that important truth. And by missing that important truth, we could miss the gift of eternal life that the father and his son are promising us. One thing thou lackest. As soon as I, I, I was reading this title, I was meditating on it. And I was like, one thing you lack, one thing you lack, what am I lacking? And the Lord, throughout the day, by faith, uh, put me in my, in my, in my mind the... Um, John 17, 3, that everybody knows, okay? And for me personally, personally, okay, it made sense. So how can I relate that the title, one thing thou lackest, when you think you, you lack, to John 17, 3? So John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life. So what is eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
two persons to know their true identity. One, the father. Two, his son. Amen? A little summary we're going to go through right now, okay? It's an examination of the unfamous rich young ruler that reveals the mistakes that led to his tragic walk away from Christ. And, you know, that could lead us to the same tragedy if we do, if we do the same error, if we, do, if we make the same mistakes. So, and the, throughout the weeks and throughout the days, the Lord told me by faith to use that story as a platform for what I'm going to say afterwards. So the Jesus and the rich young ruler is an episode in the life of Jesus in the New Testament that deal with eternal life and to the world to come. It appears in the Gospel of Matthew, but that's what we're going to see right, right now, uh, chapter 19 from verse 16 to 30, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10 from verse 17 to 31, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18 from verse 18 to 30. So for those who have their Bible, I would like to invite you to take your Bible and to go to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. We're going to take Matthew, okay? And we're going to get it very slowly, and I pray that you will be able to remember, because I'm going to break it down a little bit, okay, to see what's going on in this story. Okay, so Matthew, chapter 19, and we're going to read from verse 16 to verse, we're going to go through all the way through, okay, through the 30. So I'm going to read that to you in the New King James Version, Matthew, chapter 19, from verse 16 to 30. Now, behold, one came and said to Jesus, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandment. Verse 18 said, He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother, your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my mouth, from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, listen to this, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, As surely I said unto you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Verse 26, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said unto him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Verse 28, So Jesus said unto them, I surely I said unto you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sit at the throne of his glory, you, you, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Verse 29, And everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or father or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Verse 30, But many who are first will be last and the last first. So now, because we just read Matthew 19 from verse 16 to 30, what was wrong with the wrong ruler? Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 says, You said, 
I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That was the rich young ruler's the way he was standing next to in front of Jesus. This is the way he was. So now, let's go a little bit backwards now. Let's learn to know a little bit more about this rich young ruler, okay? In Matthew 19, 16, let me read that again for you here. Matthew 19 and verse 16. In Matthew verse 19, verse 16 says, Now behold, one came to him, he says, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Obviously, this huge triangular was a very polite, respectful, eager, young, and wealthy man who leaves Jesus at the end of the stories and goes away sorrowful. He was a ruler, possibly a magistrate, or a kind of a justice of the peace. Let me, I want you to go also to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10, the same story is going to give us a little bit more details about it. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, then it says, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running near before him, Jesus, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So when Mark tells us a little bit more about this rich young ruler, okay? So we are told that that young ruler came what? Running up to Jesus and kneel before him indicating a sense of urgency and respect. He then shows submissiveness and a willingness to be taught when he addresses Jesus as good teacher. This was not a typical form of address for the Jews at this time. Number three, his eyes were set on religious matters, on teachers, on eternal life, and good deeds. Number four, this young man came not to tempt Jesus. Isn't it interesting? But to learn from Jesus. Amazing, huh? Number five. He had the look of a seeker. He seemed willing to listen and eager to learn. Number six. We know that he was not a Sadducee because it is clear that he believed in eternal life. Otherwise, he would have never asked for eternal life. And he wanted to attain it. You see the difference, as you know, most of you know, all of you know, and I didn't know not so long ago, that the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that, <coughs> excuse me, the Pharisees believed on eternal life and the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not believe. Sad, you see? Sadducees? Yeah. Sad, you see? It's sad, you see? Sorry. <laughs> you got it, this one. Okay. An unusual goal in someone in his position and age. A man of wealth will often trust his riches and not be interested in what God has to offer. The young ruler do not often look beyond today, much less to the far reaches of eternity. Is that true? When you ask, when you start to share the good news about the Jesus, about the Father, when they are so young, they don't look at this. What they want is to be prosperous in this world, to make money, yes. But the goal of it is to glorify God. Amen? Number seven. He seemed a disciple in the making, but this story has a dark end. It was he that inspired Jesus' famous word. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. I believe personally that Levi Matthew was there to watch the unfolded of this, young, this man's confrontation with Christ. Now, the rich young ruler made at least, at least five mistakes. The first one, they are all important, but I'm going to base, I'm going to, to, we're going to, more, we're going to explore more about the last one, which is for me the one I'm going to uh, uh, explore more today, today. The first mistake. The rich young ruler did not realize that Jesus was glorifying his father. Did you notice that? Um, it was in Matthew, we just read, in verse 17. It says, so he said to him, why do you call me good? 
Listen to this. No one is good but one. That is God. That was his father. And if you, ent if you want to enter into life, keep the commandment. You know, when I was reading that verse, I was like, Lord, can you show me a bit more about what, what your son meant? And, and amazingly enough, the Lord led me actually to 1 Corinthians, as we all know, and I didn't know before, but now I do know, chapter 8 and verse 6. So let me read you again verse 17 from Matthew. So he said to me, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandment. And then, I want to share something with you that is maybe little, but though I love little details that the Lord revealed to me. And I didn't know, and maybe most of you do, but I didn't know. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 says, Yet for us, including me, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. But did you notice something here in verse 6? It says, and for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things. Does it include Jesus? I never knew that. I never saw that. When he showed that to me a couple of days ago, I'm like, what? Wow, that's beautiful. John, chapter 5. Let's see what the Bible says. John, chapter 5. And we're going to read verse 30. John, chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus speaking, red letters. John, chapter 5, verse 30 says, I can of myself do what? Nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Profound, huh? Then you turn the page and you go now still to the same chapter, John chapter 5 and verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Mostly I said unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like matter. Isn't it amazing? I think personally this is very profound what Jesus, every time that Jesus speaks is, is so profound, it's so beautiful, you know. So we, amen, yeah. So we saw the first mistakes that the rich young ruler did not realize that Jesus was glorifying his father. Number two, second mistake. The rich young ruler was unaware of his own faults. Suppose for a moment that the wealthy youth had never violated the commandment that Jesus presented to him. Suppose that he had never murdered, even with his tongue. Suppose that he had not committed adultery, even in his heart. Suppose that he had not stolen or even envied. Suppose that he had never spoken less than the whole truth. Even still, he was unaware of his own faultness. Did you notice that Jesus only presented him with a part of the Decalogue that deals with man-to-man -man relationships? Interesting, huh? The other commandment have to do with God-to-man relationships. And this young man had obviously not fulfilled these commandments. If he had fulfilled them, he would have immediately recognized Jesus as the Son of God. But he did not recognize Jesus. And he didn't tell the truth to Jesus about his behavior. He was widely naive and tragically blind. What did Jesus say in John 14, 9, I believe? I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. When Jesus says, no one, thank you, John 14, 6. When Jesus says, no one is no one. 
So we need to remember that, okay? Mistake number three, the third mistake. He misunderstood the plan of grace. He said, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? How does it sound like? Righteousness by works, huh? There's nothing we can do by ourselves. Romans chapter 3 from verse 10 to 12 says that it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All, all have turned away. They have. They have become worthless. There is no one that is good, not even one. Did you see the way Paul repeats himself? Not one, not one. But there is a message in this, which means no one is no one. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says, We are all dirty with sin. Even our good works are not pure. They are like blood-stained rags. We are all like dead leaves. Our sin have carried us away like wind. Profound statement, huh? The rich young ruler thought that he was righteous by his own doing. But Romans 3 and Isaiah 64 tells us he is in our condition if we do not accept Christ as the Son of the living God and our Savior. Only to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior, as wealthy as he must have been, he was spiritually bankrupt and terribly poor of faith. Fourth mistakes. He ran away instead of staying. A man can misunderstand the divinity of Christ, be blind to himself or herself, and misunderstand God's grace and still be saved if he will commit to stay with God. Andrew, Peter, John, Matthew and the others did not fully understand the Lordship of Jesus when they first met Jesus. And they certainly did not fully understand the plan of grace. But you know what? They stayed with Jesus. They were willing to commit to a lifestyle of learning Him and believing Him and His divinity. The disciple apprenticed themselves to Him for a long haul. That is the way to be saved. If you are willing to learn shelter with Christ on the long journey from brokenness to wholeness, if you are willing to walk all the way, every hard step, then, and only then, you're a wise man, even if you're not young or wealthy. Fifth mistakes. And this is the one we're going to stop. The rich young ruler did not recognize Jesus as Lord. The young ruler came rushing to Jesus and fell into his knees. And he asked, Do you remember what he asked? Good teacher, what good thing must I do so that I may have a real and unending life? Jesus, perceiving the youth mistakenness, answers with a question a question that would prove the depth of the youth strong ruler's knowledge of God. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Jesus was in the habit of asking such disarming questions. The young man did not recognize with whom he was talking. A teacher and more than a teacher. He was kneeling before the one called greater than Solomon. The young ruler saw Jesus as a raw moral man, a man of insight and depth but he did not recognize his divine authority and the son of the living God. And to make such a mistake is fatal. As C.S. Lewis made clear, he said, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. He cannot be only another teacher. Now, that was my turning point to be able to continue in this message that the Lord gave it to me. And I pray that you will be even more blessed than I was blessed. In Christ Object Lessons, Sister White says, that's something i never seen before. I think it's page number 492, I believe. 
the ruler had addressed Christ merely as an honored rabbi, not discerning in him as the Son of God. The Savior said, why do you call me good? There is no one good but one, that is God. Listen to this. Then she said, on what ground do you call me good? God is the one good. If you recognize me as such, you must receive me as his son and representative. Yes. Wow. I've got goosebumps all over right now. I have never seen this quote before. And you know what? I read that, that, that chapter all over and all over again. And as soon as I was reading it, that was one moment probably throughout the week or in the evening, in the morning, it was like that tiny passage I just read became eliminated. And the Lord says, my friend, we're going to work on this together. Beautiful, huh? Let me read this again. On what ground do you call me good? God is good. He's the one good. If you recognize me as such, you must receive me as his son and representative. In the last day, there will be two witnesses. One side will believe what the father said about his son. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, what does it say in during Jesus' baptism? There is three times, I believe, that the Father spoke in the New Testament. And two out of the three times in the New Testament, in Matthew 3.17 and in Matthew 17.5. So the first one was at the baptism of Jesus, and the other one was on the, trans the Mount of Transfiguration. Actually, well, why should I speak? Let the Word of God speak himself, himself. Amen? So let's go to, I know we keep reading those verses all over again, but... Praise the Lord, I was able to read one day John 3.16 and the Lord showed me what he showed me today and that was a blessing. I could have ignored it, but I didn't. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17. Actually, let's go back to verse 16. <coughs> Excuse me. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning upon him. Verse 17 says, And suddenly... A voice came from heaven saying, what did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Who is speaking? God the Father. Jehovah. The Almighty. Our Father, our Daddy. Amen? Now, if you go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. I love turning the pages. It's beautiful. Matthew 17, verse 5, Mount of Transfiguration. Let's go back to verse 5, verse 4. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Then verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a brought... Did you hear actually what he says in verse 5? While... I think it was Peter, actually. Yeah. Peter, while Peter was still speaking, which means the father take over Peter. Isn't it funny? I mean, he's like, hold on, Peter. Let me speak here. Okay, verse 5. While he was still speaking, a behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him, and suddenly a voice came out from the, of the cloud saying, what did he say again? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what did he say after? Thank you. Hear him. Do you think that when the Father says something, it means something? Oh yes, it does. Absolutely. These are pages. Page 575, part 4. Regarding Jesus' baptism, the great Jehovah has proclaimed from his throne, this is my beloved son. Did you hear that? That's his son. It's not someone else. It's not allegorical. That's his real son. When the father showed that to me last year, I was in tears. You know what the first thing I did? I literally kneeled and I asked for forgiveness because I didn't know I was an antichrist. That's hard. 
But I know by faith that the Father forgive me and his son. And I believe by faith he forgive you too because we're still alive here today and he's giving us another chance. This is why we're on probation right now on earth. Amen? Probation time. So as I said, there will be two witnesses. Once I will believe what the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <coughs> Excuse me. And when he says, this is my son, my beloved son, which means that son, my son means he belongs to me. He doesn't belong to anyone else. That's my own son. Amen? A real son. The other side will believe there is no such a thing. This is only a metaphor. That's the way I used to believe. This is not a metaphor. That's his real son. Yes, there is a lot of things I will not understand still yet on earth. But you know what? Everything will be really in heaven. Amen? Because the one, listen to this. Do you, do you remember the, the, the quotation in Isaiah 14, 12, 14? When actually Lucifer was behind with the, the king of Tyre, you know, he was speaking, you know, I, I, I will be like the most high. Do you remember that? Okay. And I'm referring to those Isaiah chapter 14 from verse 12 to 14, okay? Because the one who wants to be like the most high says, because I am the God of the metaphor, I am the Son, I am the Father, and I am the Holy Spirit. Three of me, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is how Lucifer wants us to believe in him. So we have three in one God, or the only true God and his Son, both real beings. Sons of the time, listen to this. Sons of the time, May 30th, 1895, part three. A complete offering has been made for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen to this. Not a son by creation, as were the angels. No son by adoption, as is a forgiven sinner, but a son begotten. What does begotten mean? Exactly, born. Sister White says, torn from the bosom of the Father. Wow, isn't it beautiful? In the express image of the Father's person and in all the brightness of his majesty and glory, one equal with God in authority, divinity, and divine perfection. In him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's a lot of stuff in it. Huh? So can you imagine, for example, one day, um, you work hard with your wife and you have all your life and... And suddenly you really want to have a child and, 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 and you work hard to have a child and, and you go and see doctors and the doctor says, no, you can't because of many reasons. And, and you cry, you kneel, you pray day after day, week after week, year after year, month after month. And suddenly out of nowhere, your wife comes and sees you and says, honey, I'm pregnant. And we're going to have a son. Can you imagine the joy? I never felt that joy before. I only have a daughter from my wife, and I have a grandson, and now we have a beautiful granddaughter. But I never had this experience to have a child. I cannot imagine the, the beauty to, ha you know, to, to have a child. It's amazing. You know? So you raise the child. You love him. You, you know it's from him and everything. And suddenly one of your best friends comes over and says, I need to sit down with you. I say, oh, okay, what is it? You know the son you just had? He's not your son. What are you going to say to him? Are you out of your mind? I would be heartbroken. I said, dude, just, just what's wrong with you? He's my son. Well, when we don't realize that the father has a real son, this is the father, the, the, the way that the father feels. He's heartbroken. Is it sad? Do you believe that beautiful truth about the father and the son? Of course you are, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Isn't it amazing? You know, it's like me, for example, last year. I actually cannot pinpoint the day, the hour when it happened when the Lord removed that veil. And it refer me to the, in John chapter 3, verse 8, when he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sounds, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Isn't it amazing? It's beautiful, huh? So now, let me give you an example. John chapter 6, 
from verse 65 to 69. And he said, Therefore said I to you that no man can come to me except it is given to him by my father. From that time many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus to the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word of eternal life. What did he say about that? You are the only show in town. Where are we going to go? And we build, listen to what he says. But that's again Simon Peter. Do you know what actually Simon means? In Hebrew, I said that this morning before I left. Simon means listen. In Hebrew. It's interesting. And you know the Simon Peter bar Jonah? You know what bar means? Son. Listen, son. Interesting, huh? Anyway, so, and then after he says, and, and Simon Peter answered and said, to who shall we go? We, you have the word of eternal life. And we believe, do you believe? And are sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, have I, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? Simon Peter says, we believe and sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's a pretty amount of profound, really, profound statement, isn't it? And I believe that Simon Peter really meant what he said. John 11, from verse 24 to 27 says, Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Talking about Lazarus. Jesus said to her, I am the... Listen, I want to share something with you. Actually, that the Father showed me. It was beautiful. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believe in me. What did he mean by that? What did he mean when Jesus says, he that believe in me? That I am the Son. Though we were, he were dead, yet he shall, shall he live. And soever lives and believe in me, that I am the Son, never sh shall never die. And then the most profound appeal that Jesus made to Martha, was it Martha? Yeah. Do you believe this? What did you mean the thing that, believe, that Jesus meant when he said, do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the Son? She said to him, listen to this, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. i never seen that before. We should come into the world. She said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Both times they learned the truth from, listen to this, both people, they learned that truth from a conversation. Okay? Not from a pastor. Not from a Sabbath school lesson. They were talking to Jesus on 101. Now, Matthew 16, verse 13 to 17. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am the Son of Man? Am. Then they said, Some say you are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. But he said to them, to who, but, but whom say you that I am? Who do you think that I am? In verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, again, third time. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Beautiful, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Isn't it amazing? This statement that we have read three times is the basis of all doctrines in the, doc in the Bible about God. This is a separation between the reality and myth. Or you mean nonsense. And those who believe that ah, the Son is not the Son, the Father is not the real Son, and he says, yes, I am the Son, and I, ha I have a Father, and I have a Son. Amen? This is, thus says the Lord, not from a scholar, not from a Sabbath school. We have the simple word of God here. When God says something, it is, period. Amen? Because thus says the Lord, it is unchangeable. One time only, and it will never change. Now, Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the, in the King James says, 
Thou art the Christ. What does thou mean? You. Who is you? Jesus. Is that an idea? What is you? No, that's Christ himself. It is him standing right in front of them. This is what is you is. Who do you see? Who do they see? They see a man. They don't see a glorious being. They see a man like you and me. So who are they looking at? The man, Jesus Christ. He's pretty much a man like you and me. Thou, you, is the man Jesus. I think this is very important, a very important statement. Yeah? Thou, you, the man we are looking at, the man we are talking about, with the man we are talking to, are the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You are the one that God promised us to send. You are the incarnation. What does he mean? You're not just a man. You are the incarnation sent from heaven to save us. Amen? The only way to be saved intimately is not what, he only, what Jesus did only at the cross. That was the sacrifice. There is something more that happened. If the cross is all that there is for the plan of salvation, we are all lost. Because the only thing happened at the cross is the blood. What comes next after the cross? We have to do something with the blood. And the only person who can do that is the priest. If you, do not get the, if you don't get to the priest, there's no plan of salvation. The blood needs to be applied, it says in Exodus 12. The blood has to be at the right place. That's why it is called atonement. And the atonement was never made in a courtyard where the animals were killed. It must be at the most holy place. There is no atonement with just blood. Jesus, the man who is in front of Peter, who is the Christ, sent by God, is the mediator, and that's the whole point of it. He is the only mediator, the savior, between God and man, 1 Timothy 2.5. So when Peter said, you are, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, he brought all this information with him. It's pretty loaded information, huh? So when Peter said, you are the Christ, he also said, you are the son. You are the Christ. You are the son. Amen? Listen to this very carefully. Ellen White, someone sent me this quotation. It blew my mind away. I, had, I said, I had to put it on. Letter 290, 1906. The very best evidence that we have that Christ is the son of God is our personal experience. That which our hearts has felt, which confirms the inspired word of God, makes our experience a living reality. And let not Satan in any way allure the mind or confuse the spiritual knowledge. We have Christ. We are not taught this evidence of man, but of the Lord Jesus himself. Wow. That was pretty amazing. Huh? So now, my appeal. What is the central issue here in the last days on planet Earth? Jesus already warned us from Matthew, what's going to happen in Matthew 24 from, from, Matthew 24 from verse 1 to 5. Something, other people will be, I am the Christ, and shall, many shall be deceived. So Christ was, was warning me and you about any other beings who claim to be Christ. But really is not, like God the Son, as a metaphor, allegorical. You know, the most crucial issue in the last days is and will be identity. Who really the Father is and who really Jesus is. It is important to keep the Sabbath. But if we don't know who is the author of the Sabbath, we have a problem here. So now, let me ask you a question. Which ruler, which king would you choose to serve? The one from heaven who promised you and me eternal life? Or the one who can only promise you eternal death? Do not be afraid to know the truth or to share the truth. Remember, amateur build the ark, professionals build 
the Titanic. What happened to the ark? It stayed on the water and survived. What happened to the Titanic? Thank you. It sunk. The poorest people is not the one without money. It is the one without knowing the truth. Amen. Yeshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you shall serve. But as for me in my house, you shall serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions.